Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for being in your house again today. We thank you for your grace and blessing upon our life. We're ever mindful, Lord, that without you we, we truly are nothing. And we, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to come out. And, uh, Lord, for the people who have come tonight and given their time uh, to come and worship you. We just pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts this evening, that your word would just be revealed to us, Lord, your will for our life. And, uh, Lord, that we bring honour and glory to your name. We thank you, Lord, for being able to be here together. And, uh, Lord, just bless us as we come under your word now. Lord, may we each be filled with your spirit. And, Lord, may we just uh, allow the thoughts, the cares and all the worries and, and concerns that we have uh, of yesterday, today and tomorrow to be put into your hands and just sit under your word and, uh, Lord, allow you to minister to us. Lord, we pray there be no preaching in the flesh, but you administer your truth through your spirit to our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We, look, we'd love to thank you, my wife and I, for the privilege of being able to come up and share the gospel with you and uh, to meet you all. It's lovely to meet people of the, of the same faith and the same purpose, the same, same goals that uh, we have together and, and bring an honour and glory to, to our Lord. And that's what the Christian life is about. It's, it's not about us. It's, it's about bringing praise and glory and, and, and worship and honour to our great God and Saviour. And, uh, you know, we live in a day today where that is even being scoffed at by the church itself. And uh, this evening, we're going to be looking at, um, as our brother said in the message this morning, we're going to be looking in, in, in Kings, we're going to be looking at Josiah and when the people found uh, the, the book of the law of the Lord. And uh, the title of this, this evening's message is, Do We Have a Right View of Sin? Do we have a right view of sin? And if we look around the world today, what would we say the condition of world affairs are? the condition of the people who are in the world. See, the right answer is they're in a mess. They have no real direction. There's no real hate. You know, people are looking for revival, but few, very few, are thinking about judgment. You know, in North Carolina in, in 1987, there was a conference on, on prayer and spiritual awakening. And some of you may remember the key speaker, Dr. J. Edwin Orr. And his message was, Revival is like Judgment Day. And it was the last message he was to preach because the next day he went home to meet his Lord, who he had so faithfully served all those years. Revival is like Judgment Day. Now, when you think about what he preached... That's what scripture is teaching us over and over again. Revival is like judgment day. You know, but many believers, how often do they think about judgment? They're thinking about revival. It seems as though uh, people, though, today, have, uh, have, they've, they've changed revival as from very different to what scripture says it is. And we've been changing the definition of revival to the way... We want it to be. We've changed God into our own image. The way we worship, youth work, family life, people are changing it to the way they want it to be. You, you, there's been a change to nearly every commandment of God to fit in with the way society wants to live. The Ten Commandments are continually being broken so people can what? feel right about themselves. You look at the command not to have any other gods before our God, yet people play sport, work, leisure. Do you know that people even place in their families before God? Men, if you want a godly family, if you want to leave a godly testimony, you put God first in your life. You make sure your family, your wife, your children see God at work in you. That's the testimony where to leave our families. God at work in us and they see the result of a good and godly life lived out before them. That's what God desires. We are the head of our homes. Whether we believe it or not, our children, listen, all these children here, and I'm not picking on you kids, you can smile, that's all right. Let me tell you what, they can pick out a hypocrite just like that. Just like that. 
And people are placing everything above God on the list of their priorities for life. Now, I know, hang on, mums, you may be on your own bringing up your family. I mean, man, what a great job you used to. You've still got to have God as your priority. Pro, 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 priority. Look at the Sabbath. I know the Sabbath's a covenant between God and Israel alone, but the principle of gathering together in fellowship to worship God, to hear from him through the, the preaching of the word, to take that time out of the busy life, to meditate on the scriptures, to focus on, on him is so important for our spiritual and physical and emotional well-being, yet it's become about how quick one can get away from church on a Sunday and get back home. It's about coming back, about how to please ourselves and do our own thing. This is Jonathan Edwards, I think he wrote, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, that sermon wouldn't work today, but his wife, she treated every Saturday night as if it was Christmas Eve. She would have her children eager, prepared to go to church the next day to hear what God had to say to their family. She had them excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. And men, if we aren't excited about the Lord Jesus Christ, don't expect your children to be. Don't expect your wives to be. Mums, if you're doing the hard work of, of raising your family, be excited about the Lord. <laughs> Be excited. God will do, God will fill the place of the head of your home for you. That's his promise. He'll take care of the household that needs a heavenly leader. You look at marriage. The command is not to commit adultery. Yet it's not only adultery rife in Christian circles. I'm talking to believers tonight. Not only is it rife physically, it's rife mentally. And as far as the Lord's concerned, that's just the same as physically. It's very, he was very clear even to think about another outside of marriage is adultery. When God created man, he created man and woman for marriage. Not men and men. Not women and women. It's a lie of the devil. And brothers and sisters, the church is falling for it. They're allowing it. They're encouraging it. And it's time for the, the true believers of God to stand up and show the world what a right view of sin is about. Covetousness, theft, honouring fathers and mothers. You don't honour your parents. You know what? God promised to give you a long life. Mums, dads. Give them something they can honour. Give it to them. Show it to them. But as long as everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, and it isn't any different from what anyone else is doing, we assume as long as God's not judging us, that all is fine. But all is not fine. Listen, is there, is there a real heart cry in, in your life and my life tonight for revival? And by, by revival, I'm not talking about thousands coming to the Lord. By revival, I'm talking about a deep, a real and intimate encounter with a holy God. That's revival. That's what our country needs. That's what our churches need. Brothers and sisters, that's what our families need. A personal encounter with God. And we need to get God back into his rightful position. See, people have lost the right view of sin and because of that, you know what, brothers and sisters? They've lost the fear of God. They have lost the fear of God. And we need to be involved with God. Hey, listen, at this moment, God may be speaking to your heart and to my heart. He's crying, get your Christian life in order. Get rid of what's not right with him. Get the priorities right. If you allow God first to, to occupy your lives, give attention to his ways, then he'll take care of your concerns. 
He'll help you through the difficulties. Dangers arise. You may be facing a, a real hardship. Wrap yourself up in the ways of God and he'll take care of you. It's what he wants to do. But understand, our personal involvement with God doesn't come simply because we listen to a message. And we get a funny, fuzzy little feeling and we get all little goose pimples on us. Or we read the word of God. Our personal involvement with God means that, that we have a, a deep personal acknowledgement. God, you've spoken to me. This is real. This is you. I cannot deny it. You have spoken. And when we hear the word of God, see, that means we, when we hear the word of God, it right away begins in us a process to understand and to respond to what God's saying to us. And when we come to face to face with holy God and he says something through us through his word, we immediately begin to find that we must react in a way, if this is what God has said, then this is what I must do. To do anything else is to deny God's hand at work in your life. Point one, I promise I'm going to try and get through early. Second Kings. Chapter 22 and 23, we've got the story of Josiah. And he's eight years old. Eight years old. He comes to the throne. And verse 2, chapter 22, says this, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, that he sent King Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered for, of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. Man, do we need doers of the work. Amen. We need doers of the work. Here's God's house. It's become a bit run down. It's in need of repair. The priests are cleaning the temple. What do they find? They find the scriptures. Verse 8, Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. You know, just, just picture this for a moment. The temple's in disrepair. They're there cleaning it up, maybe some builders, some stonemasons, the priests, the scribes are there. They come across a book, or maybe under a bit of rubble, a bit of dust, and they get up and they, they dust this thing off and they, they realise what they've found. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hey, churches today aren't even using the book of the Lord. They'll teach man's philosophies and add a verse to it. That's not using the book of the Lord. We're to preach the scriptures. We're to be instant in season, out of season. We're to give the whole truth, the full counsel of God. That's preaching the book of the law. See, many will say, well, let's not get too serious about our Christian life. Man, judgment day, they'll know about that one. What does Shaphan do in verse 10? He, he, he shows the king saying, Hilkiah, the priest has delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Look at the response of Josiah in verse 11. It come to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. See, Josiah and these men, it's as though they've discovered something. But it isn't a discovery of some new thing. Brothers and sisters, this is a recovery. Not a discovery. This is a recovery of a thing that was known to be lost and has now been found. Isn't that beautiful? And it's been found joyfully. And when Josiah accepted it, he then regarded this as the authority over his life. It tells us there, he rent his clothes. Brothers and sisters, do you and I need a recovery? Truly do we? Do we need a recovery from those three evils, the world, the flesh, and the devil? Do we rent our clothes when we come face to face with the holy God and, and realize the condition we are in? 
Hey, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, brothers and sisters. There's no one here tonight even who has not sinned, who is not capable of sinning. And all of a sudden, the king realised for the first time what the standard has been all along. Remember, he comes at eight years old. He's now 18. And he says, hey, God's not mocked. How do we mock God? As being believers living a worldly life. See, whenever a people sow, they will reap. The Bible's full of reaping and sowing. But brothers and sisters, when we sow something, as a gardener, I can tell you this is true. When we sow something, we reap more than we sow. You understand that? Say amen. amen. We reap later than we sow. Do you understand that? Amen. You cannot plant zucchinis and start making dinner ready for tomatoes. doesn't work that way. You reap what you sow more than you sow and later than you sow. And God's covenant with his people being read out and it's saying what God would do if the people followed and practiced what God commanded. And we know the Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 23, uh, the, the covenant listed there, and all that God has asked them to do. Now, the first part is incredibly positive. But the negative part starts in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, 15, but it shall come to pass... If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and statutes which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now in 2 Kings 22, 12 and 13, the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Akbor the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah a servant of the king saying, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all which is written concerning us. You see, as the Spirit of God falls upon Josiah, as it pierces his heart, he trembles and, and it causes him to act as a king should act. He calls his people to repent. Men, when we read the Word of God, when the Word of God touches our hearts in an area that we know we need to repent, then we need to call our families and get together and repent before God. You don't mind I don't hold punches tonight, brother, do you? Because that's the truth. All I want to see is the best for every believer. And we are losing the right view of God. We have lost the right view of sin. And because of that, we have no fear. We're prepared to live any old way and we think God is just fine with it all because we don't see judgment. Judgment is coming, brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not. Verse 16, that saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. Why? Look what it says in verse 17. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. Listen, Josiah did what we should all do he took seriously what God had said. He, he said, he, he, he took seriously that God would act upon what he says. See, he knew, hey, listen, God holds no favourites. Said this morning, that the, the cross, the ground at the cross is level. doesn't matter where you come from or who you are. There's no favourites. There's no exceptions. Josiah could see their toes are hanging over the edge of a cliff, the edge of destruction. And listen, sin today is far more serious than in this day. And Christians don't want to know that. Oh, this is all Old Testament stuff. We're, we're under grace. We're, we're, we're under mercy. And listen, under grace, yes, we're under grace. We're not under law. But God forbid we should trample underfoot the blood of Christ. God forbid. See, they, they, these people had one problem. They had put the scriptures in a place where they're no longer taken notice of. They're covered up with rubbish. 
When was the last time you had to move a TV guide to find your Bible? When was the last time you had to get rid of a worldly magazine to, to, to find your daily devotions? See, all the time and God's words being ignored and God's judgments progressing along. And they were closer to God's judgment because they had set aside the standards they were commanded to live by. See, they'd lost any standard for for godly behaviour. You know, I was working at this property one day and they... They said to me, they said, listen, could you give us two Sundays? We've got a bulldozer. We need to get this garden done. We've got paths and tracks to do. And we, we've only got this bulldozer for these two weeks and we need to, could you do the two Sundays for us? I, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do the two Sundays for you. You know, nine months of Sundays later, with my ute blown up on the side of the road, I realised... I had put the standards of godly behaviour and the priorities of God on the back burner. And God justly dealt with me. No problem at all. Justly dealt with me. I didn't blame him. Like many do. He's not a harsh. He's a love. You know why he judged me? He judged me because he loves me. He cares for me. He he, he wants to know that that, that I'm going to walk with him. He desires that. When was the last time as, as parents and grandparents we, we got to Colossians 1 and we, we sit down at our altar at home as, as, as husbands and wives together or, or mums on your own struggling like that and you pray, Colossians 1, that, that Lord, that I pray my children and my grandchildren will, work, will walk worthy of the Lord. Come to a spiritual knowledge, a spiritual understanding of, of your will for their life. Hey, God can't refuse that prayer. That's God's will for everybody. You see, repentance is sorrow for sin against the holy God. And when when God's people sit down and discuss what they think is acceptable, God, they're on the brink of judgment, brothers and sisters. Doesn't matter what we think is acceptable to God, it's what God says that matters. See, everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes, everyone's heading for disaster, and Josiah discerned it, he understood it, he knew what was going to happen. If things didn't change, you know what he did? He immediately adjusted his life back to God. And from now on, it's going to be God's standards. And he calls, you know what it is? He calls the spiritual leaders together. Together, He says, that we're going to repent as a body. And God saw that, that, that wonderful heart of, of Josiah. And verse 18 of 22 there, the king of Judah which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thy heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. When thou heardest what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse and as rent thy clothes and wept before me, I have also heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers and shall be gathered unto the grave in peace. Thy eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Do you know what happens? When when you and I come up against the word of God... Are we prepared to rent our clothes in shame of our standards? As Christians, we've got to stop standing on a pedestal, brothers and sisters. We're not any better than anybody else. We're saved, amen, for that. But we've got to have a good look. You know, is God's word just gathering dust on the shelf? We pick it up on a Sunday maybe or a Wednesday night. Hey, I read my Bible every day. Let me ask you, is it bringing you into the real presence of God? Because one cannot come into the presence of holy God 
and stay the same. And it is that simple. It is that simple. Secondly, a fear of God brings a fear of sin. See, again, when a believer has no fear of God, they're not going to fear what sin can do. High view of God, a high view of sin. Now, it's amazing how, how many can sin grievously against the word of God. You know, in the Old Testament, man, they'd be stoned to death. Hey, their children didn't play up much in the Old Testament. They disobeyed their mum and dad. You know, if they did it too often, they were taken to the gates and they were pelted with stones. Man, we were talking today. In my day, there was no problem. My mum's favourite tool was a jug cord. I remember fondly running up the backyard trying to get away from her, but I never could. You know... Many things people do today, they would have been killed instantly in the Old Testament. But for the grace of God. But for the grace of God. You know, to sin today in the New Testament era is far more serious than it was in the Old Testament with what God has done for us. You read Hebrews 10. You know, in the New Testament, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't atone for sin. Only the blood of Christ. Hey, grace is greater than the law, brothers and sisters. And to sin under grace is far greater than to sin under the law. And it's incredible that so many people believe as long as they don't feel that it's bad, as long as they feel okay about it, as long as God doesn't deal immediately with sin in their lives, that it's okay to continue along that path. See, many do not see the hand of God at work on the people of God. You know why? Because the people of God have lost the fear of God. And many in church do not like to be confronted with messages that challenge sin or condemn sin. The sin of adultery, sobriety, sodomy, the sin of fornication, of blasphemy, the list goes on and on and on. The sin of gossip, the sin of prying, or the sin of backbiting, God deals severely with these. Why? Because what sort of message does that send the world? What does it give to the world? You know what it tells the world? It tells the world, hey, Christians have got no fear of God. What have I got to worry about? They don't fear sin. And many think they can get away with it. In fact, many think they have gotten away with it. Yet in the church of God, we, we see children marrying into unsaved families, into godless homes. We see children disobedient and rebellious to their parents. We see homes that are split asunder. We see grandchildren hurting. We see them suffer. We see things falling apart. Yet for some reason they, they believe they've gotten away with sin and, and that God hasn't judged them. And don't we understand? He just did. He just did. And 2 Timothy 4, 2 tells us, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all what? Long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Will come. This, hey, this is for sure. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that, brothers and sisters, is the state of the majority of the church in our country today. That's what they've done. If we don't like it, let's get rid of him and get someone in who can just pat us on the back and send us home feeling good about ourselves. And the time is now for God's people to come back to the word of God, 
to let him tell us what the standard really is. And we don't even get one amen. Not one amen. Returning, I don't want to sin, I don't want to go over time. <laughs> Point three, returning to God. Now the word revive means return life to. You know, lost people can't be revived. You understand that? Because they never had life to begin with. See, a person who enjoys sin, who loves to revel in sin, and then nothing happens, they get away with sin and they're walking in sin all the time and have the pleasure of it, cannot be saved. God will chastise you. Oh, me, I make no apologies for saying that. You just, born-again people can't do that. Sooner or later, and I know there's backsliders. The one thing, I've been a backslider, and the one thing I know about every backslider, when they're living in sin, they are the most miserable people in the world. And amen for that. But those who have no problem at all with it, how can they claim to be born again? See, a person has to be saved to be revived. And revival is what God does to his people. And when the life of God is put away by God's people, then God's people are content to live without the real presence of God in their lives. They live week after week and year after year without any evidence of the presence or the power of God. Well, then they need to be revived. They need to be born again. And for a believer to be revived, we need the life of God to come back. And I'm not talking about a loss of salvation. I'm talking about being a spirit-filled, godly believer. In Malachi 3, chapter 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as the refiner and the purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment and I'll be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, it was discovered that a pastor had been renting motel rooms for a particular woman. Nobody had known but that's not really true. You know, what, what, what we try to cover, God uncovers. What we allow God to cover, he hides. See, God was there when he signed the check for the room. He was there. He was there, and when God dealt with that man, God came as a witness against him. And that should cause us to tremble. Listen, we know, oh, he's an omniscient God. He's all-knowing, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Now, the third one is what? Omnipresent. Do you know what that means? Oh, he's everywhere present. If you want to dig deep, it means we cannot do one thing behind his back. Not one thing. The things we hide from the eyes of others are not secrets withheld from the eyes of God. And he will show up as a witness against us. And I could bring in a hundred thousand believers who will say amen to that. And praise God for his grace. And if we lose the fear of God, brothers and sisters, there's nothing to keep us on the right track. See, many, many don't believe that God sees them and they don't believe God knows the condition of their hearts and they think if he, he doesn't stop them, then everything's all right. But God does see you. God does see me. God may not stop us right away and it's not 
all right. Because if the word of God says it's sin, then that's exactly what it is. No matter what the world tells you, and, a, and, and ashamedly I say, no matter what the church is trying to teach today either. Sin is sin. Malachi 3, 6 and 7 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers you've gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? See, when we come under God's word and when, when we hear a message that, that calls for, on, upon our hearts to get right and return to the Lord, God's people are consistently saying, well, what do I need to return for? What reason? I'm a Christian. I've been born again. I've been baptised. I've joined the Lord's church. I, hey, hey, brother, I've got a ministry in the church. I'm going to go to heaven sooner or later. What do you mean return to God? See, if there's one area that God's people are confused in, it's the area of repentance. Repentance means to be very sorrowful for one's sin. And it's a deep, heartfelt, what's the word I'm looking for? Recognition that one has sinned against a holy, righteous God. And, and if we're to talk seriously about repentance, you know what, many are praying Oh, if there are any lost people in the church today, Lord, I pray they hear what is preached and they repent. Oh, Lord, I'm praying for those people who are saved and that they, 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 they know there's sin in their life. I pray that they repent, Lord. But you know what God's shouting out to his people? He's saying, hey, it's not the lost who need to repent, brother. It's not your brother and sister in Christ who needs to repent. It's you who needs to repent. You're my child. Repent. We're the ones who move away from God. He doesn't move from us. His standards are here, clear for us to, to live by and understand. They're there not... Aren't we told his commandments are not grievous? Yet some Christians carry on like they're, they're, they're being stoned to death just by being obedient to God. See, it's the believer who's moving away from our precious Lord and Saviour. And you know what? In compassion, in great concern, God comes to Malachi and he tells him, tell the people. Tell God, my people, that the God who they have been seeking is going to suddenly come to his temple. Brothers and sisters, I'll close with this. In our day, the Lord is going to come suddenly. He is going to come suddenly. Matthew 24, 42, he says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Luke 12, 40, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You know, when the Lord comes... He's the one who'll be doing the speaking. When he comes, we will know how he sees we have lived our Christian life. And again, he, he's, he's not perfection, expecting perfection. But he's expecting a godly life. Men, it's your responsibility to live that out before your family. If you're, if you're a single mum here today, praise God for you. Let me tell you something. Allow the Lord to take control of your home. Hand it out. He, he will fill that place with his presence and take care of your children. He will nurture you. He will lift you up. He will, he will supply your need. And, and it's just a, a step at a time each day. 
walking his ways. He, he, he loves you so much, so much. And, and he says to us in Romans 14, 10, he says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. What a wonderful God we have that he stooped down from the glories of heaven, arms full of love and mercy and grace. And he says, here is the way. Jesus said very confronting words, very confronting words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That, how confronting is that? When was the last time God confronted us? More importantly, when was the last time we repented of what he showed us, surrendered our sin to him and allowed him to pick us up and put us on the path to glory? We're already on the way there. You know, we're, we're already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Shouldn't we as Christians live like it? Have we lost the fear of God and in doing so lost the fear of sin? Repent, says the Lord. Ask forgiveness and you shall find it. He'll make us right. He'll set us back on the path that he has set for us. Every one of us are on a path that he has a plan and a purpose for and it's to bring glory and honour to his son. How? By being conformed to the image of his son. If we allow him to do that, what a blessing our lives will be. All the people said? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for the challenge it brings into our lives. We pray for the areas we need to repent in, each and every one of us, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, as we do, we see your hand of grace and mercy pick us up, dust us off, and put us on that path again. That brings glory and honour to your name. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to sit under your word tonight. And we thank you for your word, for the truth of it, Lord. And may we never put it aside. May we never cover it up with the things of this world. And we have our books open and our eyes fasted upon it. And Lord, we allow you to direct our path. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. is speaking to your heart. Maybe there's an area where you feel, uh, understand that uh, you need to deal with sin, you need to repent. Um, Joel, I want you to just come and, and play uh, page 534. If you want to look in your, your song book there and um, let's just take some time to pray and uh, maybe the Lord, maybe you'd like to come and pray here, maybe pray where you are uh, and then we'll we'll sing a, a verse of this song. But uh, you know, the Lord is speaking to our hearts. Let's Let's respond to him. If there's sin to be dealt with, let's deal with it now. Let's take care of it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer with, with, with our heads bowed and uh, speaking to the Lord about yourself. Amen.